I wanted to ask you how people have been responding. I mean, we have this counter petition, right? So we have this attempt to get you removed from Spotify. Uh, but we also have people ranging from Roger Waters to Noam Chomsky, obviously, Medea Benjamin, Mark Ruffalo, uh, signing this petition telling Spotify not to cave to um, We Believe in Israel. Um, so how has that been going? Well, I mean, it's been, to be honest, two key things have been established. The aim of campaigns like this, and unfortunately, we've seen it take place with thousands of people in this country disqualified from political subjectivity during the Corbyn years, disqualified from having any type of political affiliation, um, and also, in many cases, their livelihoods taken away from them with similar kind of smear campaigns, the key target is to isolate that person from other people. And that is done through not only um, making them a sort of toxic person to be around by, and then smearing others by association. So mm -hmm. as you will have seen, one of the key things that I've been attacked on is having anything to do with uh, David Miller, Professor David Miller, who was cleared by a QC-led investigation at Bristol of any type of racism whatsoever. Um, and of course, Chris Williamson, who clearly, you know, never, you know, Chris Williamson is absolutely quite clear cut, um, not a racist, but by mere association, as in quote unquote, sharing platforms in, in true McCarthyite style, these points were used to try and smear me. But the point is, is that we've now had this um, petition signed by almost 40,000 people, but among the people that signed it very early on are really, and this is not sort of boasting or overplaying it, some of the most prominent people actually in the world today, you know, some of them. You have the Princess of Jordan, for example. You have Avi Schleim, the Professor of International Relations at University of Oxford. You have um, Rabbi David Mivasaya. You have um, Nelson Mandela's grandson, a member of South African uh, Parliament. You have Ronnie Casserills, a former minister in the South African government. You have Leilani Farha, who is a former UN Special Rapporteur. You have Mark Seddon, who is a former speechwriter for UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon. I mean, on top of that, you have a lot of people from Jewish Voice for Labour. You also have, of course, the Hollywood superstar, Mark Ruffalo. You have Anwar Hadid, Mohammed Hadid, um, you know, major figures in the United States. Michael Malarkey from Vampire Diaries. You have Liam, Liam Cunningham from Game of Thrones. Miriam Margulies from Harry Potter. I mean, the list goes on of very well-known people. On the music side of it, there are people who are worth tens of millions of pounds to Spotify, like Roger Waters, Anna Tijoux from Chile is another one, Brian Eno, UB40. On the UK hip-hop side of things, of course, you've got legends like Charlie Sloth, Wretch32, Getz, Akala, K Coke. You know, these are major um, sort of cultural figures. And for them to come out and sign a statement which clearly identifies the Israel lobby as attempting to censor me is a major game changer here. And you have to be absolutely clear about this. If you are in BICOM or are in We Are, um, We Believe in Israel, you have to understand very, very clearly that if you want more visibility and you want more people talking about the Israel lobby, then continue to attempt to censor me, then continue to smear me. Because what you will do is find that I'm not the one that's alienated and isolated. It's actually you that's alienated and isolated. I'm not the pariah. It's actually you that is now the pariah. I am not the accused. It's you that is the accused. And it's we who are the accusers. Because we're not playing this game anymore. We are not wedded and stapled to Corbynism. We are not. Okay? And, and the key orthodoxy of that political moment was not only never strike back and turn your cheek, it was never point to the direction from which these smears are coming. Never investigate these organizations who are mobilizing against you like a foreign intelligence agency. And the simple fact of the matter is, is every single one of those organizations which has targeted me 
I have investigated, I have files on them, I have information about them, and I have very, very clear links between them and the Israeli embassy and the JNF, which builds uh, settlements and ethnically cleanses Palestinian land. This is part of the reason why I have been targeted. But you will not silence me. You will not silence me. Let's be absolutely clear about that. There is nothing that you will say about me that will make me stop talking about what you are doing to people I consider my siblings. End of. In terms of this letter, we have been able to strike back. I've been very fortunate to be one of those people who has um, wide contacts and wide access to others. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to have a visibility, which means people such as yourself would, would sign it and would give me a platform. You know, But this has happened to thousands of people um, across these years in this country alone who have not had any support. And it's absolutely vital that not only do we document correctly what has happened, but also that we, you know, take measures to try and support people that have had their livelihoods completely destroyed in uh, in similar circumstances. And of course, you know, we have not seen any of the chorus of those um, who, who are um, full believers in the concept of cancel culture being someone saying something mean to them on Twitter because of something they've said. No, no, no. Cancel culture is the lobbying of institutions who then take measures which change your life. And this is real, really existing cancel culture, which we are living through. And as I say, I am fortunate because I am actually one of the least affected by it. You've seen it happen to councillors. You've seen it happen to activists on the ground. You've seen it happen to MPs. Um, Livelihoods completely destroyed um, within this, the midst of this situation to achieve a, a longer term political objective, which was the destabilizing, the debilitating of the Corbyn movement, which essentially was about the redistribution of political power within this society. What we did wrong is we underestimated the intransigence or in fact how dynamic or, or, or malignant the political establishment in this country was. We thought that it could absorb or assimilate the kind of ideas that we were talking about, major redistributor, redistribution ideas we thought could be assimilated by the British establishment. We thought we could question the orthodoxy and the red lines, which are weapon sales to Saudi Arabia while it, it, it destroys and kills Yemen on an industrial scale. We thought we could question the red line, which was Britain's um, incestuous and revolving door relationship with Israeli arms companies. We thought we could freeze all of that. We thought we could change that. We were naive. That's not the nature of British history. When you think about people getting the right to vote who are not landed gentry in this country, they had to struggle for 300, 400 years to get that. Their struggle entailed them being killed, them being like William Cuffey, the leader of the Chartist movement, a black man, a disabled black man, who was not only arrested but was actually sent to a penal colony in Tasmania, where the entire indigenous population were wiped out by their contact with the British Empire. Um, that is what the struggle for that kind of parliamentary representation um, was. You know, what did the, uh, the suffragettes do, who everyone claims they supported? The suffragettes tried to push Winston Churchill under a train. The suffragettes through bricks, through um, through through downing streets, windows. This is the reality of the history of this country. This is the reality of our political establishment. And unfortunately, we underestimated those forces.